Have you ever, even growing up, done something and the moment you did it, you regretted it? You realized, oh my gosh, I, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have opened my mouth. I shouldn't have done that action. I shouldn't have said or done whatever it might have been. Growing up in my home, uh, I think one of the, the worst things I ever did was sitting down at the supper table and complaining about the food on my plate in front of me. And it wasn't my mum that corrected me, it was my dad. And I remember the first time that ever happened, it only happened once or twice afterwards, and I learned pretty quickly that you don't complain about what mum's spent a lot of time preparing. And uh, really, in our home growing up, complaining wasn't really something that was a culture in our environment. It wasn't something that was even really all that acceptable. You could bring requests and you could say if you felt, you know, sad or sick or something. That's, that's not complaining. That's just, you know, explaining. But if it was, if it was you, you're unhappy or unthankful about something someone else has done and you're complaining about it and, uh, or what they missed out on doing, then mom and dad were a little bit, because they were training us and teaching us. You know, a good parent will lovingly and mercifully with great consistency, can train, will train a child up out of victim mentality and out of complaining. Because the moment we, we, we fall into that attitude and mindset, we, 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 we shrink down, we dwarf our life, our potential. If we give ourselves over to that, that habit or that lifestyle of complaining and victim mentality, we lock ourselves in the prison of impossibility. And so Jesus gave us a way out. All things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible in Christ. God is a miracle working God. You know, we have this wonderful God that we get to celebrate and get to praise. And so that's one of the reasons why my parents didn't bring me up, even though they weren't believers. They were, they were my, you know, they, they, they just had this inner understanding that complaining wasn't going to be helpful. <laughs> and God is a wonderful father, a loving daddy. Now, he's very merciful. Oh my gosh, there's no more gentle-hearted, forgiving, merciful Father than our Father in heaven. Jesus died on the cross. He gave his son for us. How merciful. And so complaining diminishes potential. And God is a good parent. So he won't allow us to grow up in that. But he will set us free from that with great wisdom and great, great uh, patience. Oh my gosh, God is so... And so we look at this. Jesus said, John 10.10, 10, The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. Another word for that is to diminish. He wants to remove anything good from your life. Relationships, family, work, opportunities. He wants to take away all good. But then Jesus said, I came that you may have and enjoy life. Who wants to enjoy life a little bit more? We're talking about that in this series. Seeing from God's perspective. Having God's heart so that we can enjoy life. That's where Jesus came. And have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. All you have to do for a little while is look at planet earth and know that there is the reality of good and evil. And good, God good, devil bad. And Jesus is the son of God, came to planet earth and said the devil wants to rip you off. <laughs> but I want to give you good. I want to lift you up. I've got an abundant life. I want to open expansive pathway for you. But all the enemy has is restrictions, restraints, and, and puts you down. But God wants to lift us up. So we want to talk about this perspective and, and your mind, our perceptions, our heart, and even the, even the physiological, the chemical aspects of the brain is so powerful. We're not just a spiritual being. and a phys we're, we're physical I, I, I am a spirit, I have a soul, and I live in a body. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the soul, the mind, will, and emotions, but I'm going to relate it to the, the physical brain today because it's really a doorway to the supernatural, allowing the spiritual side of you to erupt and come alive. The devil is a, de is a, is a bad guy, okay? He's not good, no good in the devil. <laughs> He's a headhunter. I'm going to show you a picture of a headhunter. My wife and I went to Peru uh, on a missions trip with, with, with 10,000 missionaries. And we saw this down there. It was amazing. There, there's headhunters down there. We didn't actually go there. Ben and Amy went into the, into the dangerous areas. We just stayed in the city areas, my wife and I. We sent them out into the, the jungle. And there were headhunters out there. Ben, I don't know if you knew that. But they're out there. And, and this is what they do with the heads when they cut them off. They shrink them. 
That's what they do. They take them and they, they shrink them. I won't go through the process. It's quite gory. But I did study it this week. It was exciting. And, and I, know how to shrink a bro- I know how to shrink a head now. <laughs> but I'm not going to do it to anyone. But these headhunters, they would take these and they would keep them as, as, as trophies. All the heads they'd lopped off, they would make them into these trophies and they used them for specific reasons. Won't go there right now. But the devil wants your head. Maybe not physically wanting to cut your head off, though possibly that's, that's what he wants, obviously, because he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. But he wants your mind. He wants your thinking. He wants your attitudes. Because if he can get your thinking, then he can get your speech. And if he can start speaking negatives like complaining, he, then he's got your potential. Because where your mouth goes and where your attitudes go, there your future will go. You want to know where you're headed, headed in your future? Listen to the words you're speaking. Listen to the attitudes that are coming out of your heart. And that is where, and, and so either God, this is really amazing, but either God has, has, has freedom to work in your life or the enemy has, enemy has taken control through the prevailing mindsets of, of, of culture. And I'm not saying culture's all bad. There's some wonderful things in human culture. Anthropology. I love to stu- study human beings across the... But there is good and evil. And there is influence. And so we want God to influence the wonderful cultures on planet Earth. Beautiful culture. God is a good God. If the devil can cause you to complain, he can shrink your brain. <laughs> and I'm going to prove that scientifically... And biblically to you today, turn to someone and, and let's just have some fun with that. If you complain, he'll shrink your brain. Come on, say that again. If you complain, he'll shrink your brain. Your brain. <laughs> let's have a look at this. I want to show you the human brain for a moment. I'm going to show you some, it's, it's this beautiful pink brain on the screen there. That little blue worm is actually not a worm. It's a part of your brain. And you have two of them on one on each side. And it's called the hippocampus. And it's a, complex, it's a complex brain structure embedded deep in the temporal lobe. And, it's, and so basically it's about the size of, of your finger bent like that. On about the height of your ear, push it in about an inch and a half, either side of your brain, down low at the back middle part of your brain. And I want to talk about this area of your brain, that blue section there. And it, it was a major, it has major role is in learning and memory. It is a, a vulnerable structure that goes that gets damaged by a variety of stimuli, and so the hippocampus, hippocampus uh, resides in an important part of the brain which regulates motivation, emotion, learning, and memory. Stanford University has done extensive uh, medical and clinical tests on the brain and on subjects humans and. And it, it talks about it's an area of the brain that's, that's um, critical to problem solving and intellectual thought. It's also the part of the brain that the... Well, actually, let's put the next picture up. The Australian Academy of Science. I'll stick to my notes. It's very important here. The hippocampus is necessary for the process of encoding short-term memory into long-term memory. So when I see my wife's face and I look away... The short-term memory is a latent image on my hippocampus. But as I keep looking and looking away and looking and looking away, there is an opportunity for the, for the neuron processes to spark and, and, and electrify in that part of the brain to, to energize the long-term memory that when I walk away, five years later, I can close my eyes and I can see that beautiful girl. And so it, it, this, is, this is so important for our long-term memory. Damage to the hippocampus results in loss of, of um, de- de- clarifying, oh, sorry, declarative me- memories, which is amnesia. So if you lose those parts of your brain, you, you can't remember anything short-term. In short, the hippocampus uh, orchestrates both the recording and storing of memories. Without this, we have amnesia. Actually, in 1953, there was a gentleman, Henry Gustav Malaison, in, uh He was 27 years old. And he went through a groundbreaking operation that they only did one of because they realized it was bad. But <laughs> they, they, they drilled some holes in his skull and went in there and, 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 and you know, took out eight centimeters of each side of inside his brain and removed his hippocampus. 
And the reason was, is because he was 13 years old, riding a bicycle, fell off it, had a head injury, and this gentleman started having epileptic seizures through his lifetime, and they got worse and worse and worse. And this operation was done, and yes, it, it helped him so he didn't have hardly any seizures anymore, but he couldn't even remember who he was. He couldn't remember people and things. For, for 11 years before the operation, to a, he's 16 years old, that's, that's all he could remember back to. And, and, and so he lost 11 years of his life. He lost all his short-term memory. He lost his passion, emotions. He became basically a docile person that he could still speak all his motor skills. He could still do everything like that. It was just amazing. But he could look at you, talk at you, and then walk away and forget that he even met you. He would get up and have breakfast and then go and then come down and have breakfast again and then go and then come and have breakfast because he forgot he'd have breakfast. That'd be great for removing guilt if you wanted chocolate cake. Yeah. Well, I didn't have a piece. Yes, you, well, no, I didn't. No, I don't remember. Oh, my gosh, you'd be great in the court of law. I don't remember anything, sir. Nothing. I don't remember a thing. And so, but he could remember things that were already stored in his long-term memory, but there was no hope of him ever filling his, and there was a story one time of, he would go out and he'd mow the lawn, they'd have to tell him where the lawnmower is every time, but they put him out on the backyard and he could go and he could mow the lawn because he could see the part that just got mowed, and he, he didn't have to remember, he saw that he did it, and so he was a really good lawnmower, and so he was really good at doing that, but he had severe short-term memory loss, speech became uh, monotone. He spoke like a robot. No emotionalism, no passion. Actually, his sexual drive disappeared completely. He was a very good, uh, really, when he was in the, the home that he was in, the nurses said he was no problem at all. And they eventually started doing major studies on this guy because he was the only guy that lost his hippocampus in his brain. And so they did psychological testing on him for over 50 years, and he became the number one subject for helping us understand memory in humans. Actually, when he gave his brain to science afterwards and they, they sliced it into over 2,000 slices and, uh, and they did, they did um, 3D renderings. You can actually see his brain in 3D now. It is one of the most studied uh, people on planet Earth uh, that's helped us understand memory because of that operation he had. But as we see through God's perspective, let's get to the bright side. As we see through God's perspective, his plan and his purpose is for us to have joy and life and, and increase in our lives. So how do we have that? Let's look first at let's not complain. So how do we put all this together? I'm going to bring this together to understand. If you complain, you shrink your brain. Think about these things for a moment. Philippians 2.14 in the voice says, Do all things without complaining or bickering with each other. That's Paul the Apostle. Don't bicker. Don't complain. Cl complaining does shrink the brain. Stanford University have done immense testing on this. And, all, and a lot of other medical facilities around the world have as well. Research from Stanford University has shown that complaining shrinks the hippocampus in your brain. It shrinks that part of your brain for short-term memory, for emotions, for relational, for vision, for hope, existential out there thinking. It says in, in one of the studies at Stanford University, complaining causes our hippocampus to become smaller. Complaining shrinks the hippocampus, an area of the brain that's critical, crucial to problem solving and intellectual thought. Complaining stops God's plans. That's not, that's, that wasn't written by Stanford. I just said that myself. But <laughs> it stops God's plans, stops his purposes. A continual cycle of negativity brings us into damaging the hippocampus. Negativity destroys the functions of this process in the brain. They're just starting to understand and realize why and how. The part of the brain uses the, for problem solving and all that type of thing. Complaining reinforces negative neural pathways and makes you see more problems than solutions. You actually train yourself to be problematic. You train yourself to be <laughs> not positive, but negative. You become a skeptic. You, you train, you, you brainwash yourself. You brain train yourself to be negative and complaining. When you complain, you train yourself to shrink your brain. You train yourself to, 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 you know, to, to restrict your abilities for possibilities. And so we look at this when you, when you complain, 
This is, it says you destroys problem solving, shrinks creativity, blinds us to hope, neutralizes faith, expands self-deception. Oh my gosh. The more you complain, the more you deceive yourself. You become self-deceived. Demotivates vision and passion. And my gosh, so negative addictions take over. Negativity becomes an addictive process. As the neuron pathways are formed in the, in the hippocampus, it starts to grow the negativity, but you start drawing towards that negativity and leaning on that negativity, and it widens the pathways of negativity. And while you're doing it, you're shrinking that part of your brain as well. And then you become drawn to negative people because it feeds that negativity. And that's why complainers hang around complainers, and they love complaining. Over time, complainers became neg become negativity uh, addicts. This was from a one research. Attracted to the drama that comes with the complaining attitude. They are also prone to black and white thinking. It's got to be this way. It's got to be that way. Emotionalism is removed. Passion is removed. The ability to see creativity and, and solutions and possibilities is removed. They can only see what's before them. Hopelessness starts to prevail. And again, complaining reinforces negative neural pathways and makes you see more problems than solutions. So you see more and more problems, which makes you complain more, which makes you see more and more problems, which shrinks your brain, and all you can see is the negative and the small. And that's why when they went into the promised land, all they could see was the giants. And it says in the Bible, they saw themselves as grasshoppers. They saw themselves as small. They couldn't see the way out. And there were two men out of the 12, Joshua and Caleb. They were thought differently. They had the big hippocampuses in their brain. They allowed God to fill them with faith and hope and positivity. Then they lived on that, that opportunity. That, like a little child. Little child starts out, I'm going to be a fireman. I'm going to be a rocket scientist. I'm going to be Darth Vader. I'm going to be Luke Skywalker. I'm going to be in a pilot. And, and, and all these big dreams. And what are you hoping for? And the older they get, the more it crumbles. The more the shrinking of the brain, the more creative. They talk about kids. Kids, 98% of children are creative geniuses. By the, time, by the time they get into their 50s, there's only two, one to two percent of people are creative geniuses anymore. Why? Because we've shrunk the brain. We've allowed the headhunter to get out there and lop it off and shrink that sucker up. Well, I'm going to tell you what they do. They, 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 cut, they cut the back behind the ears. They lift off the skin. And they'd find a small, they'd get a small round wooden ball and they'd, they'd clothe it with that and they'd sew it all up, put it together and put the hair back on it. And there you had the little shrunken head. Doesn't seem so difficult, does it now? now go home. Don't do this at home, children. Don't do <laughs> But you know, we, we do it every day when we complain. It's so simple, so simple to shrink your brain. It's so, it's so simple to, to shrink away from the good things of God. And so Hebrews 3, 8, 9, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. We see Paul writing and saying this, in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me and saw my works 40 years. They, te they tested God by complaining, by uttering complaints. And they didn't go into the promised land because all they could see what was wrong, what they didn't have, what they couldn't get, how small they were. They, they, that area of their brain was so shrunken away and shriveled up. And, basically, and, and, they, and so they had no possibility thinking. But today in Christ, we're born again. We've been given the mind of Christ. We've been given, God will not force this on us, but we've been given the opportunity to have that fresh growth in the hippocampus. <laughs> you know, I can see you guys today. You go, your brains are getting, getting expanded, even with hope, even with positivity. We're getting delivered of the addiction of complaining and negativity and small thinking. And a lot of times we feel because it's an addiction. It actually is an addictive process. It's very powerful. And we need to be brought out of that addiction. We need our brains to be washed and refreshed. Dr. Carmen has some announcements for us. She's going to talk to us about eight 
ways, keys to stay away from complaining and how our brains can be set free of this negative addiction that will shrink our brains. God bless you guys. Good morning, great church. As you're watching online, give us some hearts today. Let us know that you are connected to the family. We want to encourage you, if you're watching this on Facebook Live right now, to push the share button. Allow those who are connected to you to be able to link in at this part of the message. And we also want to encourage you to be live with us. We're in this series right now, How to Enjoy Our Lives. And so we want you to be partners with us, and we want to enjoy our futures together. We're going to have our time of giving right now, so as you're watching online, you can text to give, use the app to give, of course, you can mail in your checks, but if you're live today and you need an envelope for your giving, if you lift your hand, our hosts are going to bring you that envelope, and we're going to look at the Word of God for a brief moment about our giving. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 10, give freely and spontaneously, don't have a stingy heart. The way you handle matters like this triggers God, your God's blessing in everything you do, on all your work and your ventures. We've been studying this portion of scripture for a few weeks, and today I want to look at the definition of that word blessing. It says that as we give, it triggers the blessing of God on everything you do, on all your ventures. And that word blessing means this, a special favor, mercy, or benefit. A blessing of liberty, favor, or gift bestowed by God, therefore bringing happiness, the invoking of God's favor upon a person. And so as we are a giver, as we give, it says we trigger the blessing of God, this favor of God, this mercy of God, this benefit of God upon our life, and it says it will bring happiness. Turn to the person beside you say, I plan on enjoying the rest of my life. And so we want to pray that blessing over you as you give today. We want to declare God's blessing over the givers today. And so take a moment and let's pray. Father, today we thank you for your goodness on us. We thank you. You are a great provider. We thank you this morning. We woke up with breath in our lungs and energy in our bodies. God, we thank you for the opportunities you bring to us, God. We thank you for the work that you provide for us, God. You are a great provider. And God, today we return the tithe, that first 10%. As we do that, God, we thank you that the windows of heaven are open over the tithers of great church in Jesus' name. God, today as we present our offerings to you, as we activate generosity and we give freely today, God, we thank you that it triggers your incredible supernatural blessing upon our life. God, may there be a special favor, a mercy, and a benefit on your givers, God. May it empower them, God to truly enjoy their life. God, we thank you today for your blessing as we give in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give today. And so we are studying this series together, how to enjoy our life. That God never intended for us to live a mundane life. He never intended for us to be frustrated with our life. And he never intended definitely for, our, for us to hate our life. God intended for us to enjoy our life. It was the mission of Jesus. I have come that you may find life and you may enjoy life. I want you to turn to the person beside you again, look them right in the eyes and say, I plan on enjoying the rest of my life. I plan on enjoying the rest of my life. And so there's keys, there's principles. If you haven't been with us for the past few weeks, we encourage you to go to the website, greatchurch.ca, begin to link in. And as we've been studying together, the principles that empower us to truly enjoy our life. And so today I get to talk to you about eight ways to stop complaining and really enjoy my life. How do, I, how do I make the change? How do I make the shift in my life and really begin to embrace and enjoy my life? Number one, you have to desire to be free. You got to work on the desire on the inside of you. You've got to have this desire that there has to be more to life than this. You have to have the desire inside like I was meant for something greater. I was meant to enjoy my life. And allow that desire to be cultivated on the inside of you. You have to choose freedom. Jesus has already made a way for our freedom, but we have to choose it. We have to embrace it. We have to accept it. How about today we just say, I choose freedom. I choose freedom. I choose freedom. And so we have to desire to be free. If you complain, you remain. That means if you are complaining... Your life right now is as good as it's ever going to get. 
And for some people, that's a devastating thought right there. There's some people that if they know this is as good as it's going to get, today is as good as it's going to get, they're ready to throw in the towel because they are so dissatisfied with their life right now. But if we complain, we lock ourselves in, we remain, and this is as good as it's going to get. But Jesus has given us a vision, a word for the future. He's even created an entire series for us to embrace, to give us hope, to give us eyes to see that guess what? The rest of your life is going to be the best of your life. The rest of your life is going to be the best of your life. That you are designed to enjoy your life. So we've got a desire to be free. Proverbs 27 verse 15 to 16 says, A complaining wife, is like water that never stops dripping on a rainy day. Stopping her is like trying to stop the wind or trying to hold oil in your hand. Now, I know this is talking about women, so I think that you can have complaining men too. So if you're a man, this is still for you. But, but you know, this scripture talks about women. Actually, the word of God talks a lot more about women complaining than men. So women, we got to own it. Okay, we got to own it. This is for me. And so I remember when we first got married, I, I like to complain a bit. And uh, I was kind of one of those new wives that, you know, he might have done a whole bunch of things, right? But I could find the one thing he missed, you know, the one mistake. And so I, I like to point it out. It was like my spiritual gift to say, this is the one thing you missed today. This is the one, one mistake you made, right? And, and so this is what he would do. I do not recommend husbands do this, okay? But when I would complain, he would do this. Drip, drip. Turn to the person beside you and say, ouch. Woo. I'm telling when he would go drip, drip, I'm like, I'm going to drip, drip you right now. Like, woo, it would fire me up. And I didn't even know I had an anger problem until I got married. I thought I was like pretty calm. I married this man. I'm like, I am heated all the time. Like, I'm so angry. And so I'd be complaining, be like, drip, drip. I threw hairbrushes. I mean, I didn't have real great aim, thank God. But I mean, I was throwing things. So I don't recommend it, husbands. But I will say this, that the drip, drip began to do something on the inside. I was like, I don't want to be drip, drip. I, I don't want to be this drip, drip, drip. I want to have a good life. I want to enjoy my life. I want to embrace something that's greater. I don't want to be the drip, drip. And actually the scripture says in Proverbs 21 verse 19, it is better to live alone in the desert than with a quarrelsome complaining wife. Now, I didn't write the Bible, so don't shoot me down, okay? And, and it's much better I'm sharing this with you than him. But, but I didn't want my husband dreaming of the desert. Like, man, if I could just get away from this woman, put me in a desert alone. You know, I didn't want him dreaming about the desert. I wanted him dreaming about the oasis with me, right? And so I had to learn, this is actually an issue in my life. I don't, I don't maybe know where it came from. I don't know why it's here right now, but I have an issue and I have to learn and desire my freedom. I've got to have a hunger inside to be free. While it might feel good to complain for a moment, constant complaining will be toxic to your relationships, your finances, your physical health, your emotional health, and your spiritual walk with Christ. So it might feel good just in the moment. I got to just get it out. I got to just complain for a moment. But it is toxic to the areas of your life that you want growth in, the areas of your life that you want freedom in, the areas of your life that you want to go forward. It is toxic to it. And so we all know that there's certain, you can open a magazine, you can do a quiz online. And sometimes you do this quiz and it'll tell you, it'll kind of pop out your result. I'm going to give you a little quiz this morning. 18 signs that you complain too much. I want you to just kind of give yourself a point if one of these is you. Number one, your problems never seem to get solved. They always seem to just circle around again. Number two, you feel powerless and out of control. Three, you feel exhausted at the end of each day. Four, your mind is drawn to the past mistakes of others. Five, you don't forgive and forget. You say you forgive, but you always bring it back up again. Six, you feel anxious. Seven, you are experiencing mood swings. Eight, your sex life with your spouse is average or below because complaining hinders your ability to connect, relax, and enjoy. Number nine, you are easily upset, irritated, or disappointed in others. Ten, other people feel drained and annoyed by you. 
just keep looking straight ahead. No one will know it's you, okay? <laughs> 11, people start to tune you out. 12, mentors eventually give up on you. 13, you don't smile much. 14, you find yourself comparing your life to others. 15, you find yourself jealous of others. 16, you lack passion for life and for love. 17, you notice that God is not promoting you. And 18, favor isn't following you anymore. So if you have three or more of this, this is your quiz. If you have three or more of these witnessed with you, then you recognize that you complain too much. Turn to the person beside you and say, that might be me. It just might be me. It might be me, okay? And so we have to recognize these areas in our life and desire our freedom, hunger for our freedom. Be unsatisfied till we experience a full freedom from complaining. Eight ways to stop complaining and really enjoy my life. Number two, watch your thoughts. What are you thinking about? What are you thinking about when you wake up in the middle of the day? What are you thinking about at night? Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, be careful how you think for your life is shaped by your thoughts. It says, be careful what you're allowing to just wander in your mind because your life is shaped by your thoughts. And I want to say your future is shaped by your thoughts. So you got to take some inventory. What am I thinking about? And the best way to transform your thoughts is to begin to meditate on the word of God. To get out your stinking thinking, you've got to put something greater in there, something supernatural in there, something powerful in there. More than just a positive word of, oh, okay, I'm getting better looking every day. No, no, no. You need the word of God to transform your thinking. You have to learn how to meditate on the word of God. And Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brethren, whatever, it's true. Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So the word of God gives us access to where our thoughts should be. It shows us where to channel our thinking, what to meditate on. So we need the word of God. Number three is that we need to uncover the real reason for complaining. There's some reason why you're addicted to it. There's some reason that you keep going in that same direction. And if we can uncover the reason, wherever the root is, how many know you find a root, you can dig that out. If we uncover it, one of the reasons is fear. People fear having a terrible life. That's what they fear. It's like, I, I'm just so afraid. I'm complaining because I'm afraid nothing's going to change. I'm afraid I'm going to have a terrible future. I'm afraid this is as good as it's going to get. And what happens is because of their complaining, they actually bring that fear to pass in their life. They actually neutralize their ability to move forward, and they put themselves in the holding zone. Their fear, Job 3, 25 to 26, what I have feared has come upon me. When we have a fear that's driving us in life, we'll all of a sudden find out I'm living in the reality of this fear. Fear is so powerful. That's why it's so important we deal with the fear. How do we deal with it? With the truth of the word of God. The truth of the word of God begins to push out fear so that we can enjoy our life. Another thing that can be a root is unrealistic expectations. You know, we complain because we feel there's a significant gap between our expectations and our reality. We're like, this is what I thought it was going to be like, and this is where it is. And we feel like there's this huge gap in between. So we complain. But it's because most people's expectations were unrealistic. They had an unrealistic expectation of their boss, an unrealistic expectation of their spouse, an unrealistic expectation of what their kids were going to do when they were growing up, an unrealistic expectation of things. And what happens is they get frustrated and they complain and it limits them and it holds them back. Another root is bitterness. How bitterness, offense, unforgiveness, it, it actually pushes us to complain. It drives us to, to use our mouth to complain. And why? Because that bitterness, that unforgiveness, that offense, it's stirring on the inside of us. And it draws our mouth to complain about life. But we are the sum total today of our talking in our past. So wherever you're at today, you're like, I created this with my mouth. 
I created this. However, I'm, I've created where I am. The good news is I can create a new future. I can use my mouth for good. I can use my mouth to line up with the word of God. And I can create what God has already promised me to have. When you complain, you remain. And complaining really shows other people that you don't have self-control. That you don't have the ability to take a thought, take it captive to Christ, find the truth in the word of God, and exercise self-control over your life. And so it's important that we learn this principle. So guess what? Because God has called you to lead in the world, in whatever sphere you're in, in whatever area he puts you in, in your family, whatever it might be, God has called you to lead. But when you complain, it shows you have no self-control. You don't have the ability to lead. So we have to dig out the roots. If it's fear, dig it out. If it's unrealistic expectations, find out what is realistic. What, 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 how, do I, how do I work this? What is proper vision? Because people get all confused about vision. You know, they are all confused. I'm going to win the lottery and blah, 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 blah. It's going to happen. I'm not here to bust your bubble, but it's probably not going to happen. You know, <laughs> I mean, let's be true. You got this, this, this unrealistic expectation. I'm going to marry this man. He's going to meet all my needs. No, he's not. <laughs> he's going to be a little needy, right? You know, whatever. But even so it's like you get unrealistic expectations, people, and they create disappointment, bitterness. You got the root of bitterness. Dig it out. Do not be satisfied living a bitter life that steals from you God's purpose, God's joy. You got to dig it out. Number four, how do we stop complaining and enjoy our lives? Go over a thankful list, thankful list every day. Or that song we sang in worship today about God's faithfulness. I was just worshiping God, you're faithful. Faithful you've been, faithful you'll be. People will call it a faithful list, a thankful list. God, you've been faithful. You will continue to be faithful. Numbers 11 verse 1 says, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. People love to say Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's true. If it displeased the Lord then, it displeases God now. Look at the person beside you say, I plan on pleasing God. I plan on pleasing God. So it says when, we compl when they complain to displease God, we need a thankfulness list or a faithfulness list. Write down what God has done in your life. Write down how he's come through for you. Write down about how he healed you, how he delivered you, how he visited you. When he came into that circumstance and you got yourself in that rut, he dug you out. When he brought you peace, when you were panicking, how he answered your prayers. Write down that faithfulness list. So when you have an off day, You've got somewhere to go. Turn to the person beside you and say, I occasionally have an off day. I have an occasional off day. You need somewhere to turn on the off day. So have this list. Why? Because we forget. Some people forget what God did. They forget how God freed them from that addiction. They forget that God healed them. They forget that God brought people into their life when they were lonely. They forget that God answered that prayer. We need the list so we don't forget. Judges 8.34 says, They forgot the Lord their God who had rescued them from all their enemies surrounding them. Psalm 78, 10 to 11 says, They were not loyal to their covenant with God. They turned away and refused to walk in it. They did not remember the wondrous things he had done, even the great miracles he had revealed to them. This is what happened to the children in Israel. That's why they didn't enter into the promised land. They forgot how good God was. They forgot about the provision of God. They forgot about the deliverance of God. They forgot that if God is for me, who can be against me? So you need your list. So when you have an off day, you remember. I want to challenge you even this week. Separate some time. Maybe it's going to take an hour. Maybe it'll be a daily journey where you just add something to it every day. Start writing down and remembering when God came through, when God showed up, when God visited you, when God delivered you, when God provided the Holy Spirit will help you bring it back to remembrance. Number five, how to stop complaining, enjoy your life, choose to be around happy believers. I said happy believers because how many know that there are some unhappy believers? I mean, I, I, it's sad to say, but there are. I wanted you to choose to be around some happy believers. Limit the negative voices in your life. Hebrews 10.25 says, You should not stay away from church meetings, as some are doing, 
but you should meet together and encourage each other. That's why you need to be in a small group so you can stand together and you can encourage each other. Somebody comes in negative. Somebody comes in complaining and the rest of the group encourages that person and redirects it and you begin to go forward together. Sometimes you're the one encouraging. Sometimes you're the one receiving the encouragement, right? We need to be around believers who can do this. Psychologists say chronic complainers try to surround themselves with other complainers who will sympathize and agree with their complaining in order to validate their dysfunction. So a chronic complainer is literally drawn to other complainers because they want valid, validate my dysfunction. Tell me that I'm right. Tell me I got a reason to complain about my life. Come on, agree with me, agree with me. And what happens is they spiral down even more. You need some happy believers in your life. You need some people that you start complaining, you start complaining. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm looking at your life saying you got it pretty good. I'm looking at your life saying there's a million people in the world who trade places with you right now. Make the exchange for your life right now. You need some people who can allow and, and be around you to help you lift your eyes to see the goodness of God. Number six. Speak or write out daily confessions about yourself and about your future. That's one of the ways to stop complaining and really begin to enjoy your life. I have a couple of resources that can help. One of them is called Speak Life. And it teaches people like how to actually transform the way you live. Because we're brought up one way or we're cultured one way and we have to actually learn how do I begin to speak life when everything is not perfect. Turn to the person beside you and say, my life is not perfect. My, we're not waiting to speak right when our life is perfect. We speak right and it creates the life that we enjoy. And then I wrote another book that's called Champion Confessions that just gives you one confession from the word of God every day to begin to declare over your future. Prophesy your future into existence. Speak the word of God over it to your future. And so I encourage you with that. Psalm 34, verse 12 to 13 says, do you want to enjoy life? How many would say yes today? Do you want to enjoy life? Yes. Do you want to have many happy days? Then avoid saying anything hurtful and never let a lie come out of your mouth. When we complain, we are lying. I have it so bad. Lie. There's always somebody who's got something worse going on than you. My spouse is terrible. Lie. Because that's the same person you prayed for, the same person you asked God for. It's the same person. My boss is so bad. Lie. They're providing an opportunity for you to earn a living, for you to have resources in your life. My house is so small. Lie. Because some people are living in a tent. Some people don't even have a tent. Your house is not really that small. I have no opportunities. Lie. I never get encouraged. Lie. I have no one in my life. I'm all alone. That is a lie. And so every time we complain, we are actually lying about our life. And we are lying about the people that God has surrounded us with. And so it says, if you want to enjoy your life, if you want to have many happy days, avoid saying anything hurtful. And never let a lie come out of your mouth. As long as we complain, we remain. And so we've got to understand that, that we've got to make the decision in our life. Romans 12 verse 2 says, do not copy the behavior and customs of this world, but be a brand new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and think. Look at the person beside you today. Look them in the eyes and say, you're looking pretty fresh today. You're looking fresh today. A fresh newness in all you do, a fresh newness in how you think. It goes on to say, do not copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but be a new and different person with a fresh newness in all you do and all you think. Then you will learn from your own experience how his ways will really satisfy you. People complain because they are dissatisfied with their life. But they think they're going to get satisfaction through other people through their accomplishments, through their degrees, through their work, through their money, through their adventures, through their this, through their that. And then they're dissatisfied with their life. But the scripture says that we get our satisfaction from his ways, his purpose, 
His presence, his will, his, his power, his strength, our relationship with him. And so it says that when you begin to experience this for yourself, you will find out that his ways satisfy you. I want to encourage you this week to dive into your personal time with God. Open up the Bible. Talk to God about the real issues going on in your life. Put on some praise and worship music. Have an encounter with God. Let his ways come around your life. You will find for yourself that his ways will satisfy you. Have you ever planned a surprise party for someone and they didn't show? Give me a wave. Anyone ever done that? You planned a party, they didn't show? Have you ever been the person someone planned a party for you and you didn't show? You know what? How many times has God planned a surprise party for us, but we missed out because our complaining locked us out? The children of Israel were at the edge of the promised land. The party was there. The, the, the big grapes were there. The food was there. The, the, the land of milk and honey, it was right there. It was everything God had promised them. It was everything they desired. It was everything they'd been dreaming about, talking about, passing down from generation to generation that they were conversing about. It was there. They were right at the edge of the promised land. And it says they did not go in because their complaining locked them out of the best surprise party ever. How many times has God been planning a surprise party for us. And it's like, whoo, that's good. But we hadn't stepped in because we were locked out because our mind was somewhere else. Our complaining was holding us back from experiencing God. I want to encourage you, Numbers chapter 11, that's a great resource for you to study this week, read through that, learn from the word of God. Because complaining is not your heart's response to a circumstance. Complaining is your true heart's response to God's plan for your life. So people think, well, I'm complaining because I'm I don't like my job, I don't like my spouse, I don't like my kids, I don't like, I don't know, whatever. I don't know what you don't like. You're like, I'm complaining because no, no, no. Your complaint is not against your boss. Your complaint is not against your situation. Your complaint is against the plan of God. Because God's doing something in you right now. Maybe he's changing your character. Maybe he's molding you on the inside. Maybe he's bringing something greater out of you because he's got something bigger on the other side. He says, right now, I'm working on your character. Right now, I'm working on your heart. Right now, I'm working on the inside. And your complaint is not against these people. Your complaint is against the will of God, the purpose of God for you. And every complaint is a complaint that is rooted. The root blinds us from the goodness of God. You know, when we're complaining, we cannot see the hand of God. We can't see that God is moving, that he's moving behind the scenes, that he's moving situations around, that you think nothing's happening. There's a whole lot happening when you think nothing's happening. That's what I've learned. When you think nothing's happening, there's a lot happening. When you think God's not working, he, he's working a lot more than, you, than what you're thinking. He is moving behind the scenes. He is rearranging things. But our complaining blinds us to experiencing and accepting that goodness. 1 Peter chapter 3.10 says, If you want a happy, good life, keep control of your tongue. It's like if, just if. I mean, if, if you want to have a sad life, keep talking. You know, you want to have a miserable life? Well, just keep complaining. But it says, if you want a happy, good life, keep control of your tongue. Control what you say about yourself and control what you say about others in your life. You know, you got to stop complaining about other people. That's not going to help you. It's not going to help them. Ephesians chapter 4, 29 says, watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. Say only what helps each word a gift. Why don't you give somebody with some good words this week? Give some people, give some people at work, give some people in your family, give some people with words of life this week. So the question is, how do I communicate to someone without complaining? Because we still got to communicate. We got to talk to people. Sometimes there's issues. Sometimes something's going down. We got to talk to people. How do I communicate without complaining? Communicate with generosity. What can I also change? What can I give? What can I contribute? And you got to communicate with somebody. Bring it to the table with already, I'm coming with generosity. I'm willing to change this area. I recognize there's an issue here. This is what I'm willing to give. Communicate with grace to someone. No one's perfect, including you. 
So if you're going to communicate without complaining, you got to communicate with grace. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We need to talk about this. But guess what? I'm communicating with grace. Communicate with appreciation. While stating maybe a change you desire in someone, your employee or whoever it might be, your child, express gratitude for the good they're already doing. So don't just say, well, I want you to change this. Express some gratitude. Communicate with appreciation. I recognize you've already come so far. I recognize you've already changed. I recognize that God's doing a good work in you. Communicate with patience. You don't change immediately when someone asks you to. So why do you expect they're going to change immediately? You think, well, just do it. How about you do it? Right? You think they're just going to do it? What about you? You got to do it, right? And you recognize, oh, it takes a little bit of time to change my mind. It takes a little bit of time to change my behavior. So communicate with patience. Communicate with love. Don't ever hold back your love from somebody while you're desiring change in relationship. Communicate with love. Communicate with prayer. I'm going to pray with you. We're going to believe God for the supernatural to be in this situation. God's going to help you. And communicate with hope. Always talk about a good, beautiful future ahead. How this is going to turn around for good. How God's going to use this. How it will be part of our testimony. Number seven, how to stop complaining and really enjoy your life. I don't have time to go into this, but eat healthy, exercise, stay in shape. No one can feel positive when their body is not functioning healthily, right? So you got to put in the right things, do the right things so that you're strong, you're healthy, and that helps you to stay positive about your life. First Timothy 4, 8 says physical training is good. And then number eight, how do we stop complaining and really enjoy our life? Rely on the Holy Spirit's help. You cannot do it on your own. If you don't have Jesus, it's not going to happen. We need God. We need the grace of God. We need the Holy Spirit's help. If you say, I'm addicted to complaining, you're not getting out of this thing without God. You need the supernatural in your life. And I looked up in the dictionary, what is the opposite word to complaining? And it said this, praise and rejoicing. So it said the opposite, like these are biblical words here. Praise and rejoicing is actually the the polar opposite of complaining. So if you're addicted to complaining, you feel yourself being drawn in that way, the antidote is praise. The antidote is rejoicing. you got to crank some tunes. you got to, you know, start dancing, clap and tap your toe, shrug your shoulders. I don't know what you can do, but I believe your body can move a little bit, that you got a voice. You know how to shout at a hockey game. Guess what? You can shout some praise to God. That shout is in there. That worship is in there. Don't tell me you're a quiet person when you get excited when a nice car drives by. Don't tell me that you're not an excitable person when, the, when your team scores and you're like, go ballistic. It's in you. Activate it in praise. Activate it in worship. Activate it in rejoicing. And as you activate it, you are strengthened to overcome complaining. Isaiah 30, verse 18. Meanwhile, the eternal one yearns to give you grace. God is yearning to give you the grace you need to set you free so you can enjoy the rest of your life. The eternal one yearns to give you grace. The eternal one yearns to give you grace. The eternal one yearns to give you boundless compassion. I want to tell you today, God is not angry at you. God is not disappointed in you. God is not far from you. He's yearning to give you grace. And he has boundless compassion for you. He's like, he's like, I get it. I know, but don't stay there. I get it that somebody hurts you. I get it that you're disappointed. I get it that you went through things, but you don't have to stay there. You don't have to remain there. He's got this grace, and the grace is the power to set you free. The grace is the power to take you forward. He says, I am here. I have this. I am yearning to give you grace, boundless compassion. That's why he waits for the eternal is God, is the God of justice. Those inclined towards him waiting for his help will find happiness. We don't get free on our own. How many have tried it? Doesn't work. You're like, I had two good days and whoa, it was over. <laughs> you know, we get to our max. We can't do it without God. We need 
We need the supernatural. We need his ability to trump our ability. That where we are weak, he is strong. That he comes and he empowers us to live in victory. And today I want to pray for the Holy Spirit's help over your situation. I think we can be honest enough today. We all needed this message. That we're all on a journey. We need a little more freedom than what we've experienced before. And so I want to pray for you today as you're watching online. We're going to pray together as a community of faith right now. As we do that, we encourage you to stay linked up with us. If you're watching this or if you're listening to this while you're driving a car, pull off for just a few moments and allow yourself to just open up your heart to prayer right now. We believe that prayer works. And so we encourage you to just separate some time to join in with us. We're going to pray a prayer together. And we're, when we're done, I want to pray over you and over your families as well. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask two questions today. Number one, if you're in the place today that you've never asked Jesus to be the leader in your life, you've never said, God, I need you. I cannot do it alone. I need you. Today's the day to do it. Or you say, I did it. But I walked away and I've just been charging ahead, doing my own thing. And I need to say, God, I need you again. I, I rededicate my life to you, God. I need you as the leader in my life again. Today is the day. Or the second question, if you say, I'm living for God right now, but, but this message speaks to me. I, I, I know I'm unsatisfied with my life. I know that, that I'm, I'm discouraged with my life. I, I know that I've become a little addicted to complaining. And today I need the Holy Spirit's strength and help. I, I want freedom. I desire freedom. And you, you know inside, like, I want this. I, I want to enjoy the rest of my life. I don't want to be locked in. I want to enjoy it. If either of those, you need to give your life to Jesus or rededicate your life to him. Or two, you say, I want my freedom. I, I want to live free from this with no one looking around. Give me a hand up so I know who I'm praying for today. Okay, fantastic, 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 fantastic. Fantastic. You can place your hands down today. I want you to put your hand right on your heart today. We're going to pray a prayer together. And I want you to pray it nice and loud, nice and bold, so the person sitting beside you doesn't feel like their voice is the only one they're hearing. When we're done praying this prayer, I want to pray over you. And so I invite you to repeat these words and say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Forgive me for all my mistakes today. I receive your grace and I ask you to be the leader in my life. I need you and I thank you that right now I receive your strength in Jesus name. In Jesus name, I'm going to pray over you. Father, today every person who responded to the message in person, online, Father, today I thank you that your Holy Spirit is doing something on the inside. God, I thank you that you're working on the inside out. God, I thank you, you are the healer. God, I thank you that you are the counselor, that you are the teacher, Holy Spirit. You are the deliverer. And so right now, Holy Spirit, we thank you for doing your deep work on the inside of us. God, you've heard us respond. I want to be free. I don't want to be locked into where I'm living. I want to enjoy my life. God, you have heard us agree with your word today, God. And because of that, Holy Spirit, I thank you for your power being released on every person, God, as they have responded to your word. God, let your power be loosed on them, your ability. God, I thank you this week when we open up the Bible. It's going to speak to us. Holy Spirit, I thank you this week that, that you're going to tap us on the shoulder when we need to be tapped. I thank you that our relationship with you, God, is going to get stronger this week. We are going to depend on you like we've never depended on you before. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your peace and your strength. And right now, the supernatural being released over people's families. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you today. Awesome. Fantastic. That was a great message by Pastor Steve and Pastor Carmen. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
If this is your first time, we encourage you to check out facebookchurch.ca. That's where you can connect with us online and see everything there. You're welcome to watch us every single Sunday at 11, 12, 32, and 4 p.m. You can invite your friends and family to watch and check us out as well. But remember, you're also welcome every single Sunday in the building right with us at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. Also, if you want some more encouragement or get connected with some other great people, Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. is our small groups. You don't want to miss that. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you guys have a great week, and we'll see you again very soon.